Welcome to America's Healthiest City. I'm your host, Will Melton. America's Healthiest City is a 10-year initiative and community partnership to make Richmond the healthiest uh, city and, and community. It's a regional effort uh, in America by 2033. Uh, it is an ideas board. It's a website. It's a communications vehicle. Uh, it's spearheaded by Exponent 21. You can check out americashealthiestcity.com to see the ideas board, uh, submit ideas, comment on ideas. If you represent a nonprofit, an institution, um, uh, an academic institution, a, a business or a, a government entity, we would love to have you as an ambassador. So please check out what that looks like. Uh, it doesn't cost a thing. And all we ask is that you put your strategic decisions through the filter, which says, how will this decision make our community healthier? Uh, today, we have Jennifer Einhoff from Bold Whisper. I'm really excited to talk to her um, this is part of the Mike King Biz Radio Network on ESPN Richmond 106.1. Thank you for joining us today. Jennifer, thank you for joining me. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. All right. So today um, I was hoping that we could spend some time talking about transformation. Um, oh, okay. And, um, you know, I think we can probably cover a lot of different uh, subtopics and, and, and super topics yeah. over that. But um, I figure uh, with your experience and with... Um, you know, your storied background, I, th I thought, you know, okay. what better what better subject to kind of dive into. Now, um, I think where we have spent a lot of time in this program over uh, several episodes now and, and sort of by accident, but um, probably for a very good reason is in mental health. And, and yeah. you and I have spent a lot of time yeah. talking about that and talking about uh, tangential subjects. So um, before we dive in to the subjects, why don't you just uh, give the audience an understanding of who you are. When did you move to Richmond? Okay. What does Bold Whisper do? And mm -hmm. take it away. When did I move to Richmond? So I moved to Richmond in the early 90s. I think it was 90 or 91. So early 90s. Um, and I've been here ever since. I grew up north of Baltimore and we spent all of our vacations in Virginia. So I thought, well, why don't I just move here? Um, so I've lived here uh, for quite some time and what gone part of the through... city do you live in? I never. So, asked yeah. So I currently this. live like 10 minutes from here. I live in Chesterfield County. So I I love that um, our property, you know, talk about mental health. Our property is covered in trees. There's a little bit of a creek at the bottom of the hill. And yet I can get downtown in 20 minutes. So it's the best of everything, you know, being able to have that natural environment around me and then just be downtown and go, you know, do first Fridays or hang out at Common House or wherever, wherever I'm going. So um, I love how livable this area is and how easily you can go into different kinds of environments, different kinds of uh, opportunities. So, yeah, so I've been here. I, while I've been here, I trained and worked as an interior designer. I was a commercial interior designer for many years, uh, working to build quality environments for healthcare and uh, university and, and corporate and very firm believer that the quality of our environment has a lot to do with the quality of our life, but realized at one point that there were parts of that job I didn't love and that the parts of that job I did love were most closely aligned with coaching. So I left design and I went out and started my own company and I trained as a coach. So I'm trained in ontological coaching, which sounds so impressive. It's really just the acknowledgement that we are complete beings with emotions and with body stuff, our body is telling us stuff and we spend a lot of time ignoring it and, and the language that we use to describe and understand our world and that, that those things have a huge impact on what we even see as possible. So for transformation, we, tr we have all probably had the experience of reaching for transformation. We take massive action and then it, nothing happens because we haven't really shifted fundamentally how we see the world. So even though it seems like a possibility, it's not going to realize that. So working with clients to kind of go a little bit back upstream and understand where, the way they see the world and how that's impacting what they're doing. So I, I work, I, I do mostly leadership coaching and I work with creative leaders, the people that think up three new worlds before breakfast. And then when they turn around, their team looks like deer in the headlights because they haven't figured out how to uh, really cast the vision that they can see. Because if you are visionary, it means you can see what 80% of the people around you can't see. And that means you have a responsibility to really design the clarity around what that is to enhance your communication so that you can talk about it so that you can really help people see their place in what you see and then really harvest that creativity in yourself and others and to do that you need to be taking care of yourself so there is a huge component in what i do of moving from sacrificial to beneficial success because a lot of leadership people will get so excited about what they're doing they'll they'll devote everything to it and they're not there to see the mission through 
And so it's that piece too, especially with what we're talking about with mental wellness or just, you know, the emotional piece, but are you stopping to smell the roses? Are you looking out the window at the trees in your backyard or are you just bent over the screen? So um, yeah, that's what I do. I work with people who are our hope for the species on the planet, the ones who are going to invent our way forward and they need, they need care and they need, um, they need to be activated in ways that help them to do this in the most effective, effective way possible. So total sidebar, um, you said something about the whole being and people with emotions and, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. and I'm just reminded of this book, uh, by Chris Voss called never split the difference and negotiating as if your life depended on it. I hope you've read the book. I'm familiar with it. I haven't uh, read it. Yeah. So Chris Voss was the lead negotiator for the FBI and they were using business school practices to negotiate. And he said, we're losing too many, you know, right. too many hostages. And so right. we need to change things. So they just completely took it down to the bone and mm -hmm. rebuilt it. But their biggest criticism of the business school um, practice from, you know, the 60s or whatever was, well, there's no emotion in negotiation. <laughs> and, you know, there's some cool stuff in the book. So if anybody, if you if you are a reader, definitely go get that book because there's a lot of advice. But there's also a lot of really interesting things about emotion in business. Yeah. And I think that we're finally at this place in, in time where yeah. uh, we get to do that. We get to say, hey, you know, it's it's there are emotions. People have emotions. Our customers yes. have emotions. Our employees have emotions. We, we have yeah. emotions. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Uh, it's a, it's a mythology that we grew up with that that was very embedded in our um you know developed across the 20th century definitely that you don't you can turn off your emotions it, and there's plenty of you know neuroscience is kind of in its infancy but there's some pretty interesting suggestive uh pieces about you turn off your emotions you are incapable of making a decision it's not that you shouldn't or should use your emotions it's that your emotions are necessary for functioning and so, you know, what is the role of, because we, because we have this mythology that you can turn off your emotions, we don't know how to live with them. We don't know how to benefit from them. And we certainly don't know how to metabolize and process them. So your emotions, their job is to visit with some important piece of information that you're probably not paying attention to. And you, you know, in, in the healthiest possible way, you invite them to contribute. And then you make a decision about whether they're going to drive your behavior because emotions are a driver of behavior. When you're angry, the predisposition is to avenge or to, you know, to, well, okay, that's good. Maybe you feel that and then you have to decide, is that going to break relationship or make relationship? Is that going to break my mission or, or make my mission? But if you haven't had the conversation with the emotion, then it's going to take over and you're going to think you're ignoring it. And it's going to find ways to poke out through the, <laughs> whatever it is you're doing. And so, you know, really helping people understand, you know, on every level from children on up that emotions are a fact of human existence. And so we need to get good at them, not to manipulate them, but to live in the wisdom of what they're delivering so we can make better decisions. So we can decide, you know what, a little righteous indignation would be a good fuel right now, or no, that's really too amped up. And if I'm going to do this, I need to bring in some compassion or, you know, whatever, bring in something else. Um, and yeah, so I think there's definitely, as you said, you know, we've just been through uh, a slow rolling life and death experience, you know, three years of of pandemic and uncertainty. And a lot of people are saying, you know what, I like it's too short and I don't want to do this, but I don't know how to do it any differently. We're at this huge moment of opportunity for, we could fall back asleep and do what we were doing, or we can decide that we're going to learn from our emotions and learn from what we just did and and make a way better make a way forward but yeah it's not a tactic to notice that you and the people around you have emotions it is the most human thing possible you're listening to America's Healthiest City on ESP in Richmond 106.1, part of the Mike King Biz Radio Network today we are with Jennifer Einhoff from Bold Whisper and we're talking about transformation uh Jennifer Coaching is a lot about sort of inward yeah. reflection. Um, I think a lot of people maybe feel like it's not very comfortable to spend time <laughs> you know, reflecting and looking inward. Yeah. Um, but I think at the same time, you know, this show is a lot about, you know, not necessarily individual health, but it's about community health. And and you said something about the whole being you, yeah. when you're talking about coaching, you know, as you think about the person, there's this ex external factor. There's a lot of external factors that right. we're inter interacting with. And so I want to get to that a little bit. And I also want to talk about the fact that you're an ambassador to America's Healthiest City mm -hmm. through Bold Whisper. Absolutely. And so that's a commitment that you've made. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, while it's not a really tall order and maybe something you were already doing anyway, um, I wanted to know a little bit about how you see 
sort of that community health component? You know, what does yeah. it take to, um, you know, how do we reflect as a community to really uh, feel all of our emotions yeah. as a community and really, you know, heal mm -hmm. and, and be better in that that sort of way? Yeah, that, that balance between the inward and the outward and noticing that some of the things we think are outward are really inward and vice versa in terms of, of me versus the world or me in the world or me and the world. What is, what's the appropriate relationship? I, I tell people often that I, one of my, my job is to create safe places to do difficult work. You know, coaching may not be comfortable, but I can tell you if you don't deal with it, you know, what's coming and, and align yourself fully with yourself and with what you want and with what you see happening, it's going to hurt a lot more down the road. And I think that's, you know, that's something I have in common. My husband's a mental health therapist. And so he's dealing with different, different issues using different, different methodology, but it's still that sense of you can either spend the time working on yourself now, or you can have to deal with it in crisis later. And so for leaders, particularly, yes, it's, it, I, I, I get pushback. Oh, I want to invest in my people. I don't have time to invest in me. And <laughs> the best investment you can make in your people is investing in the leader who's seeing them facilitating their greatness and making sure that what's happening is what, what is the best possible thing. So it sounds, you know, we have that selfish, not selfish thing. I, I, so for instance, the term self-care has so much baggage attached to it. I encourage people, this is, this is my, one of my missions. I encourage you to use the term self-investment. Because the time that you spend working on yourself always pays dividends. And, and a lot of times when you build a capacity in this moment to react to whatever's happening, you don't realize you're building capacity for something greater down the road that's that's going to be even more spectacular, a bigger impact, a bigger mission. And it all started because you tackled the thing when it started to show up or you decided to understand how you felt about it or how you were going to manage your emotions around it or, or whatever that is. So while the experience of coaching is that one-on-one, -on -one, I also, you know, I build experiences too, where I get people together to talk and that, so, so moving from the internal to the external and understanding the relationship between that. And that's why I work with leaders because they are people who need to be on point to build that community. That's going to be able to move forward where everyone's contribution is valued and activated and so that internal piece is critical, is a critical starting point and those periodic self-reflection to make sure that you're on track, uh, the danger of a single narrative. If you're the only person you're hearing from, you're in danger. Just that's, a, it's as simple as that. And so how do you take in the other voices without letting them take over? How do you hear from your team, but still make your decisions? How do you take in information from people who love you, but maybe don't understand what you're up to. You know, how do you take the love and leave the, <laughs> leave the advice, that kind of thing. And it's really important to have that person who is uh, invested in you and your success, but doesn't have a dog in the fight. And that's what a coach does, you know, being that, being that person who is exterior to whatever's going on, but at the same time is deeply invested in, in you, you being amazing. And so it's a wonderful position to to be in. It's something I, I thoroughly enjoy. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's about mental wellness. It's about building capacity, and it's about being ready to be connected with other people. I like um, I like how one of the best pieces of advice comes from airline safety announcements before you fly away. It says, right. you know, make sure you put your mask on before you right. try to help anybody else. Yeah. And if you don't have the resources to do um something for somebody else it's not going to be possible to help them so uh yeah. the selfish word came out and i wanted to address that ah, because yeah. uh, you know this is kind of that thing and and you know i have a coach and i have a really wonderful relationship with yeah. my coach shout out to brooke purcell um i know her uh through a few different places but common house is one of them and that's another place where i know yeah. you so shout Community. out to common house um and one of my words that I have used a lot is lazy. And that's something that my coach has said, you know, don't use it. Oh, right. These are like external things, you know, so the expectations that you you perceive the world is having on you, or maybe they do have them of you, but you're it, assuming that responsibility is if like you right. owe the world something. I, I talk to that a little bit as you work oh, through people in yeah. coaching, how do they deal with selfish and lazy and yeah. these sort of qualities that we anoint ourselves with that may not be so positive we carry around? I, I love this topic. So I... I, I had an awareness at one point in my own life. I thought I was fearful. I thought I was cowardly. And it's because I felt fear a lot. And then I kind of looked around and realized, oh, I'm adventurous. <laughs> so I place myself in scary situations more than the people around me. So if they fear, if it feels to me that they're less fearful, they're not doing what I'm doing. Oh, 
I'm actually courageous. And so I think sometimes when we carry those labels, those, those pejorative bad labels like lazy or selfish or cowardly or whatever they might be, if you take a look around, what to what standard are you holding yourself? And how do you own that standard and understand, oh, wait, this is this is the shadow side of what is my light, which is I am I am courageous or I am I am prone to getting things done. So I notice keenly when I want to just lie on the sofa. Um, there's a, a really interesting theory out there that we should not use the to be verb, because if you say I am lazy, you are setting an expectation for the future. You're, you're defining yourself. So instead use more complex verbs that say things like right now, I don't feel inclined to do any work. And, and now you're just defining a moment, not who you are moving into it. So there's multiple aspects of that. And yeah, uh, you know, these amazing people that I get to work with and they'll come in with a label and I get super curious. Why is that? Why are you carrying that label? Everyone looks at you and sees, or maybe everyone else looks at you and sees, but maybe two or three key voices at some point in your life told you you were lazy or fearful or whatever, whatever that thing is. But a lot of times it's because you have stuck your head out of the rabbit hole. And so you're feeling this keenly. It's, 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 a, it's part of the conversation around, we were talking about imposter syndrome. If you're sticking your head out where other people aren't, you're going to feel keenly the discomfort of that. And sometimes you turn that inward as a definition that's not necessarily yeah. helpful. It's definitely not an emotion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it brings, it has emotions with it, right? So yeah. if you say I am lazy and you feel guilty about that, you're going to feel remorse or you're going to feel, there's a whole bunch of emotions yeah. that ride along. But we've got to inspect those things. We, we and feel, right, them. feel them and decide if that's really how you want to move forward. And even if you feel them, like even if, so the people with whom I work, their biggest fear is regret. They're not motivated by most of the fears that other people are. And so if you're feeling lazy, it's an acknowledgement that you have this fear that you won't contribute everything you're here to contribute. And you're noticing that frail and feeble human that you are, you had to actually lie on the sofa for two hours because you had done so much that your brain needed to shut down for a little while. Um, it's it's probably an acknowledgement of the gap between what's driving you and where you are at that moment. But without the self-investment of saying, okay, what am I feeling? What's the wisdom in that? So I'm feeling lazy. So I'm feeling remorse. Okay. Let's feel a little remorse. I'm sad that in the human condition, I can't go full out 24 seven. I'm sad that I have to sleep. I'm, I'm angry that I, that I, you know, need to go get a glass of water, whatever it is, water, yeah. <laughs> you have your water with you. Um, I, I think that that's an important conversation to have. It's not, you're not discounting the emotion. You're saying, I feel this way. And so thank you for letting me know that I feel this way. Thank you that I feel remorse or that I feel fear about not giving my all. But then how do I reconcile that with the need for rest or, you know, and creativity, <laughs> creativity requires a lot of rest, a lot of very good quiet, unstructured time. One of my favorite stories about that, some news reporter asked Agatha Christie in 1953 or four, how do you get your best ideas? And she said, oh, that's very simple. I get them munching apples in the bathtub. And so when I'm feeling, when I'm feeling that drive, like I need to do more, I picture her toes at the end of a bathtub with apple cores around it. And I go, okay, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you need the away to get to the two, you know? Um, so if Agatha Christie was a smart enough to know what fed her, her genius and b willing to do it. Yeah. Who are we, right? <laughs> who are we? So, um, I'm not going to put the words in your mouth, but I'll tell a little story. And I want to talk a little bit about trends in leadership because, sure. um, you know, as a part of leadership, Metro Richmond, um, alumni, you know, some of us have to do a little bit of work afterwards and we're reimagining quest and we're asking some questions of leaders, um, about trends in that process. And so we'll get there. Okay. But one of the things that you said that really struck me, and it's something that I feel, um, you know, remiss to, to not go to is creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, but before I do that, I just want to remind the audience, uh, please uh, visit America's healthiest city.com. Um, check out the ideas board, submit your ide ideas, comment on ideas so that we can all get together and make these things happen. Uh, this is ESPN Richmond 106.1, part of the Mike King Biz Radio Network. We have Jennifer Einhoff from Bold Whisper. We're talking about transformation and creativity and self-investment and uh, all kinds of stuff today. Uh, but we're going down into trends of leadership and creativity. So okay. last week we spoke and we had a really wonderful conversation, a couple hours long. 
And um, I was doing a million things and really cramming a lot in. Yeah. And I went to um, IT for Causes had a really wonderful event called IT uh, Tech for All, which is a um, you know education event about green energy yeah. and and lots of different things. Anyway, so yeah. I'm we were the lead sponsors at Exponent Twenty One, and I got the opportunity to stand in front of the room. And and I because we had spent time talking about courageous creativity, yeah. I just you know I talked about that, and I said this is what we're doing in our organization. I didn't say this is what we sell or what we want to sell you. I just didn't talk about any of that stuff. Yeah. And I had a line of people that came up to me afterwards to yeah. say you know some compliments about my speech, and I mean I just off the cuff said all this stuff. Right. I had somebody from a, a, a multinational corporation come up to me and say I have two websites that I need you to build, and you know it's it's just really interesting when you start to touch on. Mm-hmm. Um, the the emotional issues and the the mental yeah. health issues. I think everybody is yeah. kind of in this, this space of feeling vulnerable, needing to be vulnerable. Yeah. So um, uh, we've got about four minutes left. I'm just going to give it to you okay. to talk about what you see as trends in leadership. And then, you know, maybe you can touch on some of the conversation we had in creativity. Sure. So um, as a population on the planet. I feel like right now we're in a moment bigger than the leadership conversation where we are seeking to reclaim ancient wisdom. So you see people seeking out older forms of wisdom, re- going back and reading like desert mothers and fathers and stuff that's been inaccessible. So there's this need to tap into who we are on the planet and who we've. what's the best of the wisdom. At the same moment, there is a need to create things that have never existed before, to create these new things. And so this this idea of grounding in 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 the unchangeable or the eternally wisdom, you know, the, the the human pool of wisdom, but then also this creativity piece. And creativity is messy. It is messy, and a lot of our structures do not have room for mess. You know, if you're going to be creative, you're going to come with a fully formed idea, and it's going to be marketable the day you introduce it in, in a committee meeting and it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. So how do we make, how do we make room for creativity as leaders? How do we make room for that creativity? If you think about like skunk works and we have all these stories The the Corvette was designed after hours by a couple of overeager um, engineers. Uh, uh, it's masking tape was a pet project of someone whose boss told him he couldn't do it. Richard Drew, I think his name was. So there's all these stories and we tell these stories, but then do we actually make room for that to happen in our organizations? So how are we creating safe containers, you know, relatively safe containers for them to go do messy things and still accomplish the things that are already tidy, like keep, keep moving on the initiatives that are already working or that are doing the right thing while at the same time, and it's this sense of here's the box and here's all the things that need to stay stable and here's all the floaty stuff on the outside of that box. And the box is only going to stay relevant if we address what's out there. And so, you know, I teach um, I teach design cycle thinking as a way of uh, being a little systematic about the design process so that you, when you're already feeling a little uncertain or a little bit off kilter because this is messy, well, at least I know I'm here on the cycle or I'm doing I'm doing what's necessary. So finding ways, finding support, finding ways to... Um, to take the unnecessary risk out of it so that there's plenty of room for the necessary risk when you're being, when you're being creative and, you know, organizations that start out, um, I was reading something this week. They said, they never want to hear the words we're scrappy and we want need to live like a startup again, because it's, it's, it, it, organizations can get old and stodgy. How do you, how do you refresh your organization? It's a big question. Um, and it's not going back to where you were because you're no longer where you were. It's about, okay, what's the place where we're open to this mess and this risk, frankly, creativity is a risk. Um, and it's the personal pieces of, of our, do our people feel safe enough to do this? Do they have the personal uh, mindset pieces that are necessary for, well, there's gotta be a way to, we gotta keep going. The persistence and the, the comfort with ambiguity and investing your discomfort in something because you're gonna be uncomfortable anyway, you might as well invest it in something good. And then the organizational pieces of how do we make sure that that, we have that in place, but we're still seeing to the health and well-being of the organization. And honestly, that's every single group. I do work with non uh, nonprofit, government, and and private sector, and they're all doing some version of that right now. So we've got to change uh, to stay healthy. And uh, I heard uh, Courtney said, I can't remember the 
the publication, but she had read it as a, a virtuous cycle, uh, yeah. the act of creativity. And we do not need uh, inspiration uh, to leverage that. Uh, Absolutely. I, I need to dig this article up. And no, that's that a really there. good point. I think we have some mythology there around, well, creative people are people who have lots of inspiration. Now, creative people are people who are willing to entertain things when they show up and not decide too quickly what they mean. Versus, oh, there are people who wander around and lightning bolts strike them in the head and they deliver fully formed ideas. Creative people tend to be people who get curious, like what else can you use a paperclip for? Or what, you know, what else? And how long can you hold that open question? We are rewarded for having answers in our culture. We have disincentivized holding open questions, but creativity requires keeping that question open until, until maybe past until, you know, so and then knowing the moment where decision is necessary, like where it's now it's time to we do all this divergent thinking. Oh, we're going to converge on this one. We're going to play with this and see what happens. You know, we're going to invest in this idea. So it's that, you know, that in and out that needs to happen too. getting good at that, because some people are just constantly divergent thinkers and then they never get to the putting putting anything on the ground. So both of those things are necessary. Well, you and I need another uh, three hours on the <laughs> yeah, show. Uh, so thanks for joining me today. To Thank take you. us out, I just wanted to uh, say, folks, we are, um, everything is wrapped here. So uh, this Friday, April 7th at uh, 6.35 p.m. is the opening game of the Flying Squirrels. Uh, it's a sold out game. You can't get tickets unless you visit gonutsforhousing.com. Uh, check that website out, go nuts with a Z for housing.com. Uh, our, our sponsor, Exponent 21, is donating $20 for every extra base, extra base hit of the season to Housing Families First. So you can learn about it there, but you can also fill out the form and get free tickets to the game. If you get in early enough, we only have about 48 tickets. Some of my team is going to take some of those, uh, but we'll give you some if we have them. So please fill out the form. And we've got other tickets later this year that we can give you. So this is America's Healthiest City. Um, please check out americashealthiestcity.com as well. And we'll see you next week. Uh, ESPN Richmond, 106.16 a.m. on Thursday.